Welcome to the Heather Penny Podcast, where our goal is to help you reach your potential by increasing clarity, building confidence, and engaging courage. Heather is a leadership coach, trusted advisor, and admired author. I'm Christina Morales, a writer and marketer, and Heather is my dear friend and my coach. So today we're going to discuss that now is the time to stop apologizing for your life. So Heather, you suggested this topic. What does it mean actually and is apologizing for our is it apologizing for our past discretions for decisions that others don't agree with what do you mean by people apologizing for their life well honestly i think it's a mindset you know Mm -hmm. this is why i wanted to bring it up because i think it's around when i turned 40 kind of midlife where i just realized i'm living in this posture of kind of looking around to see who am i offending (laughs) what did i do wrong how do I make it right? And I was putting way too much energy on that end of the spectrum. I needed to start building my confidence and looking out and saying, I think I'm done apologizing for my life. I know I'm not perfect, but I am not going to keep living with this focus on what, where am I messing up and how do I make it right? And I think I wanted to start moving this energy into what is it that I'm doing well? What is I'm naturally good at and how do I start growing that side of the spectrum and really create more of a balance? And I, I I say this carefully because I never want anyone to overcourse correct and like throw a caution to the wind and say, I'll never apologize again. (laughs) It's so not what I'm saying, but I was the type of personality that had, had really overcourse corrected on the side of apologizing way too much. And so, you know, 80, 90% of my energy felt like it was just constantly worrying about that once I started course correcting that more and getting more of a 50, 50 balance or probably closer to 70, 30 balance. I think the older I get, I care less and less, but I think it's important for me because it's something that I'm moving out in and it's building my confidence. So that's, it's more of a mindset that shifted me and then really grew me into the, the world and the life that I wanted to step into. Mm-hmm. So what does this conversation sound like the self-talk? Um, what do we feel like we have to apologize for? It, like, get into specifics. What do you mean by that? What are we? What do we feel like we're doing wrong, and what do we feel like we're saying wrong? Well, I have a really good example of that actually yesterday. <laughs> <laughs> Perfect. I, I was working with a, a leadership team, and basically, it got sideways really quick on um, some leaders. One got a misunderstanding. And then before he even checked his intent, he kind of jumped on the other two leaders. And then a fourth leader walked in in the middle of this conflict. But it really started with this first person saying, I think this is going wrong. And now I'm going to jump in and I'm going to start telling everybody this is going wrong. Mm. They didn't stop and really check. Hey, I'm a little confused. I want to check something with you. And so as we were unpacking that, you can kind of see uh, it was a misunderstanding, a communication thing. But one of, one of the things I said to the two leaders involved, really the executive team, I just was saying, make sure you apologize for the right thing. Don't just give a blanket apology of, oh, I'm so sorry, because you're so relieved to kind of have that connection again. I want to say, be very clear of what you're apologizing for. I'm sorry that you felt left out, but I'm not going to say sorry. <laughs> <laughs> to the fact that um, I defended myself when I felt ambushed by you. See the difference? Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. So I think it's a little bit more of an intelligent apology of just making sure what, you, what you're apologizing for. And what I've noticed, and I see this honestly, um, I want to say I see it more with women, but as I've been working more and more with men and women, I see it with people who are really focused on getting it right and building that relationship. Sometimes they they overtake responsibility for the issues that are going on. And I want to say, "Mm, let's separate this out and let's focus on what you can own and what is not yours to own. Hmm. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, and it seems so difficult because everyone gets so offended these days that we do have to be careful of what we say. Mm -hmm. So where does that fit in with all of this and doing apologies and being more cognitive about what we say and, It's so hard because some people just spew everything out without apology. And then some people are so afraid to say anything because you don't want to offend somebody. So where's that balance? Yeah, that's a great question. I think that when I was working with this one client comes to mind and 
I'll just call him Sam for lack of a better <laughs> word. I always want to protect the anonymity. Absolutely. But Sam and I were talking and it was early on in our relationship and he was trying to figure out who I was. So he started kind of jumping to some assumptions and some conclusions about me that were inaccurate. So at one point we got on the, on the phone and he really started yelling at me about some things that he thought I was doing. Now, I'm not going to sit there and apologize for what I feel like is false accusations of me, but I am going to slow it down and tell him I care mm -hmm. and that I'm committed to working this out. So what I do is I just immediately stop the conversation and say, hey, Sam, just a minute. <laughs> I'm really confused because I don't know what's going on here. Um, I'm happy to apologize or own something, but I need to understand this first. Mm -hmm. Once we slowed it down and started to understand what was going on, I realized it had nothing to do with me. Mm -hmm. It had everything to do with him um, kind of making the mistake of seeing me as someone else in his life that had hurt him. And so once I understood that, I said, hey, I care, but that's not at all what I was doing. So in order for you to feel safe and comfortable and trust me, let's, let's decide how we want to create some um, rules, so to speak, for our relationship, some working conversation. And one of the things we, we put in place is if at any time he was feeling controlled, mm -hmm. he got to stop the conversation and he simply got to say stop. Mm -hmm. The funny thing is once we establish that rapport between us, he never had to use it. And he's become one of my favorite clients and we've been working together for years now. But again, if I, all I had done was apologize, it wouldn't have done him any good or me any good. He would have walked away thinking, yep, I knew that's what she was doing. Right. And um, sometimes we tend to apologize because we're so surprised by it. But I really encourage people to stay curious and apologize for what they know they have done that shows care and compassion for the relationship but don't apologize if you're confused because mm -hmm. it's not doing anyone any favors. Does that make sense? Yeah. So this is where my coaching session starts with you. <laughs> this is where our re we're getting real again. <laughs> so uh, in my personal life, there are some people who have hurt me. So when do you agree to disagree? And when do you agree to dig deeper and bring up the issues? Like, these people don't really want to dig into it. So do I just say, okay, I'm sorry for bringing this up. Uh, clearly you don't want to deal with this and I move on. Or do I say, no, we need to work this out. If you want a deeper relationship, then we need to move forward and really address this. Yep. Okay. So I'll use you as an example then, Christy. Please. What you're going to want to do is you want to hold the 50-50 rule. It's not a relationship if you're holding 70% of it or 80% of it or 90% mm -hmm. of it or even 100% of it. That's not a true definition of a relationship. Mm -hmm. The more you can keep this idea of the 50-50 rule, I'm willing to step into this, but you got to meet me halfway. Okay. And so, and I've had to learn this the hard way too. And particularly with family members. <laughs> I heard someone call family members like kryptonite. You feel strong everywhere else, but the moment you step into it with family members, right? <laughs> in, right? So if it's family members, I'll just give a big disclaimer. This is the hardest place to do it, but it's still important to value the 50, 50 rule. We're all adults now to be able to say, I'm willing to step into this with you, but I need to know if you're you want to hear feedback from me. If you only want to give me feedback, then that's not going to be fair. Mm -hmm. And so I just ask, do you want to give some give and take? And if the answer is yes, and I feel like they're really stepping into it, then that's where we can start progressing. And I see trust kind of like a continuum, mm -hmm. one being low, 10 being high. Great. Once we meet at the 50 yard line and we kind of keep working on this together, it goes up from two to three to four to five, but it takes multiple conversations before we move up into a high level again. Mm -hmm. If someone doesn't even want to have that initial conversation, which I've had, I've had people say to me, nope, I don't want to have that conversation. There's nothing for me to own. There's only everything for you to own. Mm -hmm. You know, in my earlier years, I tried, I tried. It's what I call the tap dancing. You know, we're like, what? Okay. <laughs> How do I keep you happy? Right. It's my own. What I have to own is that's my own form of control. I don't want to disappoint them. I want their appro approval and I want to keep them happy. So I have to own that piece. 
if I'm sorry for anything, I'm sorry for that, for me and what that does to the relationship. Mm -hmm. And their expectation or demand is not fair. So one, once I have that clarity, I have to call it. And as I've gotten older, I just check that quicker. Mm -hmm. If I hear someone go, well, no, I, I really want to tell you everything that you've done wrong to me. And I want to hear you say, sorry. That's when I kind of sigh and say, yeah, that's not going to work for me. <laughs> it's just not a relationship. You know, I'm happy to own my part of it, but I'm not willing to keep stepping into the relationship where you want me to keep apologizing for offending you. Mm. It's, not, it's not fair. Mm -hmm. And that's so good. Uh, that's kind of what I'm doing is I'm like, you need to apologize for the past. I'm on the opposite side of that conversation. But it's funny because I feel like my whole life, like, you know, you just take it. And then now I'm 45 and I'm like, no, now, like you said, I'm done apologizing. I'm going to stand up for myself. And now they can't accept this new role of me standing up. And they're like, why are you offended all the time? We have to walk on eggshells around you. And I'm like, no, for so long, you've just done whatever you want and I'm done. Now I'm going to stand up for myself. And so it's a new change. And it's like what we're talking about, becoming the yes. best version of you. And now when you're owning your own confidence and your own clarity, yes, it's hard for other people to accept it when they've been able to step on you and do whatever they want. And you just kind of eat it, eat it, eat it. And now when you stand up, now you sound like you're the difficult person. So right. it's really seen that? Yeah. This is where I coach people a lot in this. Mm -hmm. You can be an asserter or you can be an accommodator. You know, if you're constantly apologizing, you're an accommodator. If you're constantly demanding to be heard, you're an asserter. We have both of us inside of us. The key is not to over-assert or over-accommodate. The key is to live in that beautiful balance of, I think it's time for me to assert. I've apologized three times now, and I'm not hearing any responsibility on their part. Okay. Now I'm going to start asserting. Mm -hmm. um, and each person, I think, has a tendency to lean one way or the other. I tend to lean toward over accommodating, over accommodating until all of a sudden I blow up yeah. or I go inward and I get depressed. Me too, Once yeah. I start realizing that about myself, I have to gently insert in the asserting and start balancing that a little bit more. I think understanding what you lean more toward helps you understand, am I over asserting because I happen to be lean more toward asserting or am I over accommodating because I happen to lean more toward accommodating? Mm -hmm. You learn to evaluate that and recognize that true love, true power is this ability to hold that tension. And so one of the things I do quite a bit is just to have an internal check. Do I need to assert here or do I need to accommodate? Mm, that's good. And also because I believe in a higher power, you know, I believe in God. It's, mm -hmm. That's how I pray. <laughs> should I assert mm -hmm. here or should I accommodate? Mm -hmm. So I invite in more of a divine wisdom too, to support me in that inner dialogue and conversation as well as I might step into this with some really trusted advisors, so to speak in my life. One of them being my husband, mm -hmm. I'll say, do I need to accommodate here? And do I owe someone an apology? What's mine to own? Or do I need to assert here? And I have a, a just a close group around me that helps me hold that tension and figure that piece out and mm -hmm. gives me accurate feedback. Because no one's ever going to get it right 100% of the time. Mm -hmm. Does that help? Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's really good because uh, we can control our actions, but we can't control the actions of others. Bingo. And so when I say, okay, what, what am I going to do here? Am I going to assert? Am I going to step back? And you kind of know what the other person's going to do too. You kind of know like, okay, they're going to get offended. They're going to get mad. And is it worth the battle because you're not going to get anywhere? And so, yes, you know, yes. it's just, kind of a balance. Um, I was reading a book. I love fiction. And it said, um, when you're content with yourself, then you're more willing to accept the uh, others, like the, the quirkiness of others. And so when we're content, then we find our own security and strength in who and what we are. And so that's part of when you're done apologizing is I know who I am. And so I don't have to apologize and I'm content with where I'm at. Is that true? That's so true. I'm, I'm so glad you said that. One of the dynamics I realized I had to start understanding is trusting myself that I'm seeing this accurately. Mm -hmm. So when I kept apologizing in some relationships, 
it gave me a temporary relief because I got their approval and I didn't disappoint and I felt loved, but it really was not helping the relationship. So once I realized that I was actually hurting the relationship by not asserting, Mm -hmm. um, I had to step into that and I had to learn how to trust how I'm seeing this. And so one of the things I do is, is I just check it. You know, I'm happy to have a conversation. I just want to make sure this is two sided (laughs) Mm -hmm. because I have to understand that piece. And you mentioned earlier about you're waiting for them to apologize. Oh my word. I've been there too, Christina. Mm -hmm. I'm like, they owe me an apology. (laughs) Yeah. And for me to apologize, that becomes a, really a control issue in a battle of the wills. And so one of the things I do quite a bit is just, I have to step back from that because then I start playing the control game and I don't want to play that. Mm-hmm. Do they owe me apology? Yeah, they do. But if I sit there and wait for them, you can see that I'm staying, I'm keeping myself stuck in a relationship that is not healthy, functional, or equitable. Mm -hmm. So one of the things I really try and practice is a sense of bless and release. Mm -hmm. You know, I bless you and I release you, but I'm going to be doing a 180 here and moving on to someone else (laughs) that is more fulfilling. I'm not going to sit there and keep looking at you, waiting for you to stay engaged with me in the way that I need to feel that fulfillment. That's me trying to control the other person and I'm really keeping myself stuck and it's a victim posture. Mm. That makes sense. Mm-hmm. There's a line in Fiddler on the Roof and it says, may the Lord bless and keep you far away from me. <laughs> <laughs> so I will give you that blessing. And it's giving them your power too. Like what I realized is when I'm stewing and saying, you owe me apology, you were so, you wronged me. I'm stewing over it. I'm giving them my power and they're like, going shopping, eating dinner, not giving me a second thought. They don't care and they don't know. And I'm the one that's just, it's like a disease. I'm just, you know, uh, I'm uh, having all these problems inside yep. and they're like oblivious. So yep. that's the heart of forgiveness. It's about us, yeah. not the other person, right? Absolutely. Absolutely. Mm-hmm. Um, and no one lives in a bubble. Most of our audience is married and has kids and our lives are intertwined with these people. What do we do if those people closest to us hinder our potential? For example, I have a friend who has rebellious teenagers who are making bad decisions and the parents are like, A, what did I do wrong? But B, are people judging me? And do I have to apologize for what my kids are doing for the actions of other people? So how do we not apologize and take that on for the decisions we can't control? Wow, you asked some deep ones, Christina. (laughs) My life is a deep pit. (laughs) Well, let's take that scenario. I think, again, remembering that love is the biggest power of all, and as a parent, recognizing how to love ourself and not put a heap of shame on ourselves that our kids have turned out a certain way that makes us look bad. Mm -hmm. So we have to deal with our own shame and love ourselves through it because we really can't control how our kids turn out. Are we a part of it? Certainly. Mm -hmm. But to put the hundred percent of uh, onus on ourselves as parents is not fair. So kind of that idea of loving yourself as a parent. Well then also out of that will flow how to love your, your child. Your child is trying to figure out life and in it, they're trying to make poor, you know, they might be making poor decisions, learning how to shift out of that shame mode and into love helps you put the focus where it needs to be, which is Mm -hmm. my kid needs me right now. My Mm -hmm. kid needs me not being steeped in shame, but just being there for them. Mm -hmm. And so, and I think every parent has had a moment where they're, mortified with their kids. You know, I remember my little son at three when he was so verbal and started pointing out fat people all through Target. And and he's so loud. He's like, why are they fat? Why are they fat and in a wheelchair? I mean, it was just like, how do I get my kid to be quiet? Wow. And I just realized that if I respond to that with shame, he'll take on that shame. So I had to be really cognizant in that moment. I'm not even sure if I did it well, to be honest, but I still remember that moment going, oh, okay, I need to slow this down. I need to recognize the embarrassment and shame that's coming up in me. And I need to not pile it on my son. I remember just getting down to his little eye level and said, you know what? We're going to talk about that when we get in the car (laughs) because I wanted him to be able to talk about it. And I wanted him to be able to to ask me about it. And I wanted him to feel safe with me. Mm -hmm. And I just, 
but I also needed to help put some social boundaries on them is, yeah, that's not making them feel good. Mm -hmm. So when we got in the car, I explained obesity, explained diet, nutrition, and exercise. And then I also explained just the, the pain that overweight people feel Mm -hmm. and they don't need it to be pointed out. So then I had to kind of go after his emotional intelligence too and empathy. So it was a powerful conversation, but your kids are going to break social faux pas because they're trying to figure out life. Mm. I always tell parents just stand by them, have the strength to ignore the shame and the judgment. Your good friends will stand near you. And if they can't stand with, with you when your child's making a mistake, honestly, how good a friend are they? Mm-hmm. <laughs> when my kids have struggled, the, the people close to me in my life have stood with me and helped me navigate that as a parent, feel good about myself as a parent, and more importantly, loved my kids through it. Mm-hmm. That meant the world to me. Mm-hmm. So I think who you surround yourself with that and how you are selective with that when your child is going through a hard time is critical as a parent. That's good because I feel like my kids are such a reflection of who I am. And so it's hard not to take that on ourselves. Like in preschool, my kid threw a chair. I'm like, oh, Lord. (laughs) And they're going to. They're going to mess up because they're people. Yes. See, they're interrupting me right now. (laughs) They're never done. It's never over. (laughs) Exactly. So what do we do when... um, we're faced with judgmental people. How do we just, I mean, you don't want to put a wall up, but when you come up against someone who's judgmental, you just say, that's their problem, not mine. You just move on to what you know to be true. What are some tools that we can have? Well, I think you have to recognize what kind of season you're in in life. If you're hurting and your, your inner gas tank, so to speak, is depleted and you're running on fumes, judgmental people are going to be like a spark to the flame that is going to be very painful to encounter. So recognizing that judgment from people, different seasons of your life might be harder than others. Um, So I think that's the first thing I always tell people, just kind of do a quick check and find out where you're at in your life Mm -hmm. and be very cognizant of who you're surrounding yourself and when, and when you're feeling judged. My other thought too, is you can't control what people think of you. And I think, again, that idea of blessing and release seen and just saying, you get to think what you need to think, and I am not going to continue to apologize for my life. If mm-hmm. I feel like I've done something wrong, I go run it by my trusted circle and say, mm-hmm. did I mess up here on that podcast when I was talking to Christina? <laughs> <laughs> I got 20 angry complaints about it. Was it something I need to own? You know. Mm-hmm. And sometimes they'll say, yeah, maybe you can handle it this way. And other times they'll say, nope. There's nothing. People just got uncomfortable and didn't want to hear it. And then I have to decide what is true. Do you know what I mean? Mm-hmm. And I think in this world where we're so busy, busy trying to point fingers of when we're getting offended, I think sometimes it's truth and we have to own it. And I think other times we have to grapple with the fact that was really uncomfortable to hear and I didn't want to hear it. And it's only in our uncomfortableness that we learn how to change and grow. So we have to have some measure of uncomfortableness in our life in order to be better people. But I think people just kind of like to put that, I'm uncomfortable, I didn't like it, therefore, a finger pointing back, you offended me. Mm-hmm. And that's a really black and white kind of thinking. It's just one basket we're putting it into. And I don't think it's fair to the complexities of the human individual and all the conversations that we're trying to have and the backgrounds we're trying to navigate and the, the growth that we're all trying to do. There's so, so much more that we can talk about besides that one filter of, am I offended or am I not offended? Mm-hmm. See how limiting that is? It's a very limiting posture mm-hmm. in our world. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. It feels like uh, I'm not a victim, so quit victimizing me, and I'm not going to victimize you. Let's get over this already. I love that. I love that. Let's, let's do a podcast on that one, Christina. <laughs> <laughs> quit being a victim. You can quit making me one. Yeah. yeah. We want the pity and we want the attention. And so we need to stop doing it in a negative way. Exactly. Yeah, I love that thought. That's definitely a running theme I've been seeing the last probably four or five years, particularly is just I'm watching this victimization kind of growing. Mm -hmm. And I think it is stemming from I'm offended, therefore I'm a victim of you. I'm like, no, I've had some awful things said to me, but I'm not going to be a victim to that. You know, I'm going to rise stronger. I'm going to confront it. 
if it's happening to me right there directly, but if it's indirectly and it's happening and swirling around me and it's someone I don't even know, I'm going to just step away from it, you know, and I'm going to, to rise stronger from it. So I think learning how to live in a posturing of thriving and stepping into things versus looking for the next time someone is out to get you Mm -hmm. or limiting ourselves. Yeah, that's so good. Well, that's all the time we have for today. <laughs> this was a great yeah, went fast. <laughs> I know. And this was so helpful. Uh, please subscribe to the Heather Petty podcast. And for questions, comments, and resources, please visit heatherpetty.com. Remember to live your best life. You have to live intentionally. Have a great day. We can't wait for you to join us next time. Thanks, Heather. You're welcome. Good talking to you. You too.